Hello, welcome. Um, I'm Derek Morrissey with ACS Orange County Chapter and fellow board members Kendra Leak and Hannah Rich and our um, special lecturer this evening, Robin Baird. Um, we're so excited to hear about conservation and management of Hawaii's false killer, Hawaii's, Hawaii's of false killer whales. Um, how do you say it, Robin? Hawaii is good. Okay, all right. I know I'm so sad um, to read the the synopsis of the fact that you know it's it's still a bycatch thing that's decimating the population and with laws in in place and so yeah that'll be great and if, for those who do not know Robin is a uh, research biologist with Cascadia and has written two books and authored over 150 different articles and uh, scientific papers and is just a, a plethora of information and knowledge. And uh, so we could probably ask you anything about um, whales and soccer, apparently, and uh, you would be able to answer those. So hopefully everybody's had time to come in and let's get this party started. All right, Tom, go ahead and share my screen here. That look good for everyone? Yes. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for being here. And um, before I get started, I want to just uh, acknowledge that the work that I'm going to talk about is really a collaborative effort with a lot of different people. People play a critical role in the field, collecting data, in the office, uh, working with photo ID catalogs and analyzing data sets. Uh, we've had funding over the years from a lot of different organizations and, and um, agencies, uh, most notably National Marine Fisheries Service, Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center, uh, and uh, Office of Protected Resources. And we have a lot of collaborators, and, and they include individuals from uh, various National Marine Fisheries Service uh, Science Centers, as well as universities and, and other nonprofit groups. So I'm going to talk about the interplay between science management and um, various other sort of parties that can influence uh, how management happens uh, in particularly with false killer whales in Hawaii. Are you familiar with the science players in many cases? In, in, in the case of false killer whales, it includes the science centers. It includes Pacific Whale Foundation, Wild Whale Research Foundation, um, various other um, organizations as well that are, have played large or small, small roles, ro roles uh, with false killer whale science in Hawaii. And in terms of the managers, it includes both National Marine Fish Fishery Service, both in Hawaii and uh, in headquarters, as well as within state waters, the Hawaii uh, Division of Aquatic Resources. But there's a lot of other players that are involved. Uh, they include other nonprofit groups, NGOs like Natural Resources Defense Council and Earth Justice and Center for Biological Diversity, uh, industry groups like the Hawaii Longline Association, and then groups that are sort of somewhere in between management and industry. They're mainly industry support groups like Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council. And, and, and there's a lot of other uh, players that aren't shown here, um, including community scientists and 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 a lot of uh, fishermen and, and tour operators and others that are interested in, in false killer whales and, and their management and conservation. Now, a quick uh, summary of sort of a little bit of background on false killer whales. If you look online, you can still find lots of websites that say false killer whales got their name because they look like killer whales. It's obviously not true. They were originally described from a, a subfossil skeleton and were given the, the name Sudorca because of the similarity in the skull and the teeth between false killer whales and, and killer whales. They do, though, share a lot of similarities with killer whales. They're both long lived, they're both slow to mature. Uh, they have a low calving rate in the case of false killer whales. Uh, the one good estimate out there is about one calf every seven years. Uh, and both species also um, go through menopause. The females stop reproducing sometime in their 40s. They're both top predators, which means they're not common anywhere in the world. There are some major differences, though. False killer whales are largely tropical and subtropical, although they make occasional uh, forays up into to temperate waters, like a group seen off Southern California yesterday. Unlike killer whales, they're often confused with other species, pilot whales, pygmy killer whales, melon-headed whales, and they're primarily oceanic. Um, and unlike killer whales, they're not very well studied. 
uh, the Hawaii populations are the most well studied in the world and, and there's just a couple other areas where there's been intensive research on, on false killer whales. Now, our work in Hawaii is actually a multi-species project. False killer whales are just one out of many species that we study. Uh, this map shows three days of survey effort off Hawaii Island. We try to cover as wide a range as possible, both uh, north and south along the islands and, and offshore. And we, we work with almost every species we encounter. We've had funding and, and directed projects on beaked whales, bottlenose dolphins, dwarf sperm whales, rough toothed dolphins, and, and false killer whales are, are, while they're our highest priority species, they're, they're not encountered very often. So I'll show you this video. It shows two of our main um, research techniques, photo identification. Uh, and in this case, on top of that camera, there's a, a laser, two green dot lasers. This is the, a false killer whale off of Kauai. And in the bow of the boat is Daniel Webster with a, a air rifle, and uh, he's going to deploy a, a limpet satellite tag on this false killer whale. It's another one of our major uh, research methodologies. Now, the limpet satellite tags uh, basically allow us to study the whales when, when they're not in the areas where they're easy to study. So this animation is eventually going to show five different whales that were tagged a couple years ago. Uh, off of Kona and their movements among the islands. Uh, we know that two of the animals are part of the same social group. And yet here, these two from what we call cluster one are actually separated and, and moving in different areas around the islands. And the other three are from a, a different social group. And this animation shows a few different things. One is it, it shows how quickly individuals are moving around the islands from windward to leeward and, and uh, and along the entire uh, main Hawaiian island chain. It also shows when there's multiple individuals that sometimes they're coordinating their behavior, like the two that are off of uh, Hawaii Island uh, together. And other times, even though they're part of the same social group, they, they are separated quite widely. So it's a, the, the tagging work has been a great way to really uh, understand um, habitat use and as well as social dynamics in the population. Now, another main technique that we're using is biopsy sampling. And we, we collect biopsy samples basically for a, a wide variety of collaborative research projects. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of these uh, in terms of some of the results, but it includes the genetics. Uh, and this biopsy arrow is actually just bounced off this pilot whale. And you can see where it had hit the animal and it takes a, a pencil eraser size uh, plug of skin and blubber. And from the skin, we, we pass those samples on to, in the case of false killer whales, the Southwest Fishery Science Center. They can get the sex of each individual that's being biopsied, uh, relatedness of individuals, mother offspring or father offspring, um, population structure, are the animals around the main Hawaiian Islands different or, or similar to the ones around the North, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands? Um, we can use it for aging and epigenetic aging study that's ongoing and, and can also use it for cell cultures. Sa the same samples can be used for stable isotopes, for body condition in terms of blubber histology, uh, and persistent organic pollutants, things like PCBs, uh, as well as hormone chemistry. So a lot, of, a lot of different things that can come out of one biopsy sample. Now, in our field work, we also uh, just do a lot of observational and, and photographic documenting of, of things like, what are they feeding on? Uh, and in the case of false killer whales, they were lucky in that they bring most of their prey up to the surface, and they tend to have fairly large prey that are uh, relatively easy for us to get a photograph of or to recognize. Uh, and they often will pass their prey back and forth the same way that killer whales do, so we can um, get a prolonged look at what they're feeding on. And we know that they're feeding on a wide variety of uh, both pelagic game fish and reef-associated game fish. So in the upper left is a, an ono or a wahoo. Uh, in the upper right is a mahi-mahi. Uh, middle right is a mongchong. Uh, bottom right is an opa. Uh, bottom left is a broad-billed swordfish, and the middle left is a uh, uh, amberjack or kahala. So just illustrates uh, the, some of the diversity of prey. We also know something about their diet from stranded animals, and Christy West from the University of Hawaii uh, runs the stranding network out there for, for dead stranded animals and has documented uh, 
uh, diamondback squid in stomachs, as well as purpleback flying squid. And those are two species that we've never documented through any of our visual observations. Now, another main and really important research methodology that we, we use uh, is community science. And this is a, a word cloud from a couple of years ago of, of all the individuals that had contributed photos of false killer whales and other species. Uh, and, and you can see that it's a huge number of individuals that are, are contributing photos. And these are people that either work on the water or play on the water. Uh, and uh, includes tour operators as well as fishermen and dive boats. Uh, and, and really that uh, fills in a lot of the information when, when we're not out there. Now, the study is in its 25th year. Uh, it was started originally off of Maui in, in 1999. Uh, typically go out to Hawaii for two or three field projects a year, which are usually a few weeks long. And, and typically, but not always, have them off more than one island in a year. Uh, so, uh, you know, this map on the right shows that off of Kauai, we've had field work in 14 different years, seven different years off of Oahu, 10 different years off Maui Nui, and, and the last 22 years in a row off of Hawaii Island. Since COVID started, we've been working with uh, Colin Cornforth and Captain Zodiac in Kona. And uh, when tourism shut down, uh, Colin had been working with us for a few years and was on our permit, and he was able to keep up the work by doing what we're calling rapid response efforts. So uh, taking advantage of, of uh, reports of animals or, or just really good weather days and getting offshore and able to uh, continue that work. Uh, so that's been really valuable. Uh, we actually have a field project starting up in, in um, just over a week off of Kauai, so that'll make our, our 15th year off Kauai, and if you scan this code, you'll be able to follow along on what we're seeing. Now, even though we've only worked off Oahu in seven different years, we've uh, got great partners in terms of tour operators off Oahu that just send photos of almost every encounter that they have of whales and dolphins. And off Maui Nui, we've got a great partner with Pacific Whale Foundation that, that fills in uh, a lot of information uh, compared to the relatively small number of projects that we've had there. Now, we've encountered uh, 18 different species of adonisites and three different species of baleen whales in our work in Hawaii. False killer whales are not very high on the list. Uh, they rank number uh, seven for cetaceans encountered, but more than half of our false killer whale encounters have come from either radio calls or tracking a tagged animal uh, or working with the Navy researchers off of Kauai that use their hydrophone range. And we've really learned to uh, better find false killer whales. We've learned where their hotspots are. So if you had looked at this same type of list uh, 10 years ago, false killer whales would have been 11 or 12 on the list, and they're slowly moving up because we're, we're able to increase our encounter rates. Now, photo identification is really the, the bread and butter of everything we do. Uh, we have uh, a catalog going back um, to the mid-1980s from photographs that Dan McSweeney uh, started taking off of Kona. And I'll, I'll mention if any of you know anyone who did any work on whales or dolphins in Hawaii in the, in the 70s or 80s or 90s that may have taken photos of false killer whales, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're able to, because our catalog already starts in the mid 1980s, if we can get photos that are even 30 years old or 40 years old, there's a, a good chance we might be able to match them to our catalog. Now we use these photos to uh, look at a whole bunch of different things, who travels with who, and you can use that to uh, both look at social structure and population structure, where individuals are spending their time, life history, when they might first give birth, or how often they give birth, and really importantly for mark recapture abundance estimation. Now, this is a, a social network, and I'm going to show you a couple um, images of this social network. Each one of these points rep represents an individual, and if they're together in the same group and joined by lines, then they were all seen together at some point. So, for example, uh, these isolated clusters with just four or six individuals, they were individuals that were only seen on a single occasion. And any of these components that have complexity to the multiple linkages were, were groups or individuals that were seen on multiple occasions. Now, this group that's highlighted in, in red, these were all individuals that were photographed around the main Hawaiian Islands, and they all link by association in this social network. 
Now we have satellite tag data from, from this cluster of individuals from 48 different occasions where we've tagged individuals. And this map on the right shows the, uh, the density of those satellite tag uh, locations. The, um, the solid line that you can see is the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone around Hawaii. And you can see that the individuals from this largest cluster in the, in the social network all remain around the main Hawaiian islands. Uh, but you can also see there's some really uh, high density areas in, in certain areas such as north of Molokai and, and uh, north of Hawaii Island. Now, um, this then goes to how the science relates to management. So uh, based on the photo identification information and some genetic information that I'm going to talk about in a minute and the uh, early tag data, this group of individuals was recognized as a distinct stock in Hawaii by National Marine Fisheries Service in 2008, the Hawaii Insular Stock. Now we had also uh, photographed, we and, and, and groups like Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center had photographed uh, false killer whales in offshore waters. These did not link to that main cluster or main component to the social network. And a couple of these groups had been tagged. And uh, you can see here in the map, uh, instead of remaining around the main Hawaiian Islands, these animals are moving over very wide ranges. And uh, this, uh, these animals were then recognized in the same year in 2008 as a separate stock, the Hawaii pelagic stock. Now, if we zoom out on those same satellite tagged individuals, you can see that these Hawaii stock animal, Hawaii pelagic stock animals uh, range uh, really both offshore of the main Hawaiian Islands and the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and well out into international waters. So the, the track that heads off to the east, uh, those animals moved about 2000 kilometers uh, from the main Hawaiian Islands. And so they're overlapping both with US fisheries inside the and outside the uh, exclusive economic zone, as well as a lot of non US fisheries out in international waters. Now, there's some groups that were photographed either off of Kauai or off in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Uh, from our work off Kauai and from the Science Center's work in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And again, like those pelagic groups, they did not link by association with the main Hawaiian Island animals. They didn't link with the pelagic stock animals. And the tag deployments, although the sample size is quite small, uh, show that these animals are moving uh, primarily in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands from, from Kauai up to Gardner Pinnacles. And it was several years later as information on this, this population came in at a much slower rate than the other populations, but this was actually recognized as a Northwestern Hawaiian Islands stock in, in 2012. So again, a, a good example of how the science really fed into to management for this species in Hawaii. Now, the genetic results uh, support that all three of these populations are, are reproductively isolated or genetically differentiated. Uh, this is a, a minimum spanning network, network or joining network for mitochondrial haplotypes. Mitochondrial DNA is inherited from a mother to her offspring. So um, these all come from biopsy samples that were collected both in Hawaii and elsewhere. You can see in the color coding that there's samples from Japan and the South Pacific and some from the Atlantic. Now, both individuals from the main Hawaiian Islands and the northwestern Hawaiian Islands uh, population share a common mitochondria haplotype, which suggests they share a common ancestor and probably originated from a single colonization event in the, in the archipelago. But these two, do, two different stocks do actually differ uh, both in ter terms of mitochondrial DNA ratios and in nuclear DNA. Now, the animals from the pelagic stock uh, are, are also different from both the main Hawaiian Islands and the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, uh, both in terms of mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. So this uh, basically supports that, th that these are uh, really good, different, separate populations. Now, for the main Hawaiian Islands insular population, we started to get evidence uh, by the um, mid to late 1980s, that uh, 1990s, 2000s, mid 2000s, I'm looking at these numbers in 1993, uh, took me back a bit, but uh, by the mid-2000s, we started to get evidence that the population might be declining. 
And that first real evidence was uh, aerial surveys that Joe Mobley was doing for humpback whales that started in 1993 and, and covered, as you can see in the track lines here, the entire main Hawaiian islands. And his sighting rates in the uh, 1990s were relatively high for false killer whales, but then dropped off dramatically by the late 1990s. And he actually had no, anim no false killer whales in a 2000 survey or a 2003 survey. And the question was at that time when we started looking at, at uh, these aerial survey data, was there something else going on that might have been influencing that decrease in sighting rates? So this graph on the bottom left shows sighting rates for four other species, shortfin pilot whales, spinner dolphins, spotted dolphins, and bottlenose dolphins. Two of those are increasing slightly, two of those are decreasing slightly. So it suggests that the, what, what Joe saw with false killer whales was something real happening. Now there's several other lines of evidence. Um, the genetic analyses that Susan Chivers and colleagues undertook, uh, published in 2007, uh, suggested that there was a decline in the effective population size. Uh, Steve Leatherwood and Randy Reeves had actually undertaken an aerial survey in 1989, looking specifically for false killer whales. Uh, they found uh, groups of up to 470 individuals. Um, they were the third most com common species encountered versus the ninth most common in the 2000s. Um, Dan McSweeney, who I mentioned had been working in Hawaii since the mid-1980s, uh, noticed a decline between then and the mid-2010s. And another study uh, by Pacific Whale Foundation found a de decline in sighting rates off of, off of Maui Nui. So a lot of different independent lines of evidence that the population was declining. Now, this, all of the scientific evidence then led to uh, one of the NGOs, the NRDC, to petition National Marine Fishery Service to list the insular population as endangered. Um, and the science uh, side of that happened fairly quickly. The uh, Pacific Island Fishery Science Center, within a year, produced a status review for, for Hawaiian insular false killer whales, suggesting that they uh, were probably warranted being listed. And then it took a couple years for National Marine Fisheries Service to act on that. And this also shows the difference between the science side of National Marine Fisheries Service and the management side of National Marine Fisheries Service. The science side can work fairly rapidly, but the management side often has a, a lot of inertia or other factors that come into play. And in this particular case, um, this final listing uh, as endangered came out at the end of November in 2012. And some of you remember that there was a, a presidential election early in November of 2012. And, and the word was that uh, they had decided many months earlier they were going to list them, but held off actually announcing it until after the election in 2012, mainly because they didn't want anyone to use another listed endangered species of whale as, as a sort of a talking point in, in the, uh, the politics of, 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 of the election. So it, it's, it's an example of how uh, politics, even national politics, can sometimes slow down uh, what may be happening in terms of management. So since that ESA listing in, in 2012, what's happened with the population? And uh, this is actually uh, unpublished work from uh, Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center. It was, has been presented at a couple meetings. Uh, and it basically takes all of the photo identification data from our, our group, from Pacific Whale Foundation, from various community scientists, uh, from Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center, combines it to look at uh, long-term uh, abundance and trends. And what you can see is that the population appears to be continuing to decline. So it may have been at a peak sometime around uh, 2003, 2004, uh, but uh, for the last uh, 10 or 12 years, the population seems to be declining. And if you look at the, this is a Bayesian analysis, uh, which you can largely ignore if you're not familiar with Bayesian uh, statistics, but basically the, the take home is uh, that if you look at the last uh, 10 years in particular, and that's this graph on the right, these are the possible uh, trends for the last 10 years. Uh, and the average of these trends is about uh, minus five and a half percent. So that means that over the last 10 years, the population has been declining at an average of about 5% per year. And so it's, it's, a, it's um, not encouraging, um, but it's the first 
really good information on on the trend in the population since that much larger decline that that appeared to have occurred between the late 1980s and the early 2000s. Now, why would the population be, be declining? And I think the most obvious answer, it has something to do with their food. Uh, there's a couple different reasons why this could be important. But if you look at, at the uh, illustrations on this particular slide, one of the things you'll notice that these are species that are all um, subject to, to human fishing pressure. So, um, and, and that's that I think is key. But another component of it is those are all tend to be upper level, upper trophic level uh, prey fish themselves. And the higher you are on the food web, the higher uh, uh, your levels of things like persistent organic pollutants you're going to have. And uh, this was a, a paper that was published in 2020 by Michaela Cratifil, who's now a PhD student at Oregon State University. And it looked at uh, persistent organic pollutants in, in false killer whales in Hawaii uh, based on the blubber samples of the biopsies we've collected. And the uh, important finding is that uh, all of the adult males in the population, about one third of the adult females and most of the juveniles and subadults in the population have PCB levels, which is an, are an industrial chemical that are high enough to uh, either influence the immune system function or reproduction. And the stranded animals, which were collected by Christy West, uh, had the highest PCB levels, which again are really kind of a smoking gun for, for the potential role of, of persistent organic pollutants. Now there's other ways that the prey base could be, or the, the prey species could be important. Um, the top graph shows the catch per unit effort for yellowfin tuna in, in troll fisheries around the uh, main Hawaiian islands. And there's been this long-term decline over the last, uh, fit over 50 years. Uh, and importantly, if you look at the bottom graph, which starts in the, the late 1940s, the, the average size of yellowfin tuna has been decreasing over time. So in the 1940s, the average fish weighed uh, almost 140 pounds, the average yellowfin tuna caught around the main Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and in the, the late uh, uh, 2000s, the average fish was around 65 or 70 pounds. So it's half the size. So not only are there fewer uh, yellowfin tuna, but the tuna that are there are smaller, so the whales will probably have to work harder in order to, to, to basically um, meet their energetic needs. And Hawaii fisheries management is uh, a little bit different from the mainland. There's no size limits for any of these pelagic species. There's no catch limits for most uh, nearshore fisheries. There's no observer programs or electronic monitoring in nearshore fisheries, and, and recreational fisheries are, are completely unregulated. Uh, so there's just a, a, a vacuum in terms of management of, of fish populations that could be affecting this population. Now, there's also a possibility of, of deliberate shooting. And uh, while that's not being documented for false killer whales, it's, it's well known for other species in Hawaii, uh, rough-toothed dolphins, bottlenose dolphins. Um, many fishers are carrying firearms to either kill sharks or deter sharks from, from taking their catch. Um, and uh, false killer whales are well known to depredate fish from fishermen. So it's, it's possible that uh, a very small number of fishermen uh, may retaliate uh, when, when a false killer whale comes near their gear. We do have a lot of other types of evidence for fisheries interactions. Uh, we published a uh, first paper on this in 2005 and then an another one in 2014. And it's just looking at the types of injuries that individuals have that may be indicative of surviving past fisheries interactions. So these are, are typically line injuries to the leading edge of the dorsal fin. Uh, in one case, uh, individual missing the dorsal fin entirely. And uh, the disfigurement rates, this type of dorsal fin disfigurement rates, uh, is relatively high in false killer whales compared to uh, any other species of, of whale or dolphin in Hawaiian waters. And this is these are the results from the 2005 study. Uh, in the 2014 study, 9% uh, of the individuals from the main Hawaiian island insular population have evidence of these types of line injuries on the dorsal fin. And uh, this particular individual shown here, this is from 2016, we know that they're still acquiring these types of in injuries today. Now we've also been looking and we're currently working on a manuscript on both dorsal fin and mouth line injuries. 
Uh, mouth line injuries should be a better indicator of, of how many individuals are getting hooked because if they're getting those dorsal fin injuries, it's usually by being hooked in the mouth and struggling against the line. And almost a quarter of the individuals in a 2017 study that we undertook uh, had these types of mouth line injuries. And this particular case, this individual, you can see it's both missing a lot of tissue on the upper uh, lip uh, and actually has some broken teeth. And, and that would have occurred by an animal getting hooked in the mouth and then struggling against that line. And these are only capturing the animals that survive fishery interactions. We really have no way because there's no observer programs at looking at how many don't survive. Now, I, I put this in to uh, remind me and everyone that these are not just pelagic game fish. These are also a near shore species, some of which are, are fished directly from shore like aluas or, or jacks. Um, and and they may be fished from shore in relatively shallow water, but false killer whales are using water that may be only 30 or 40 feet deep at times. And fishermen in recent years have also been using drones to basically take, fishermen fishing from shore use a drone to take their line offshore in order to catch uh, species like this. And, and that basically puts them out into much deeper water where their uh, likelihood of interacting with something like a false killer whale would be higher. Now, we've been trying to get a better idea then of how this information, again, the science can be used to inform management. So we published a paper in 2021 that was basically using a combination of uh, commercial fishing data and our satellite tag data to try to figure out which fishermen are most likely to be the ones that are interacting with false killer whales. We'd had a number of fishermen who fish primarily off Kona, the west side of Hawaii Island, say, well, we never see false killer whales or we never have false killer whales take our catch. And, and uh, the question is, were they um, telling the truth or, uh, or were they um, just saying that because they were worried about some sort of uh, management action? So we took the tag data and the commercial catch data and combined them and uh, basically were able to demonstrate that the fishermen were telling the truth. If you look at which fishermen have the highest likelihood of actually interacting with false killer whales, uh, that's shown in, in these uh, two graphs on the right. It's probably the fishermen that are fishing north of Molokai, uh, east of Oahu, and off the very north end of Hawaii Island, and not the fishermen that are fishing, fishing down off of Kona. Based, based on where the whales are spending the time and how many fishermen are in different areas, the fishermen uh, in these lighter shaded uh, blocks are basically going to have a much lower likelihood of actually interacting with fisheries. So the problem is there's a large number of uh, fishermen in, uh, in these uh, commercial fisheries around the islands. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different types of fishing. They're all hook and line fisheries of one sort or another, uh, trolling, paluahi, ikashibi, which uses squid uh, as bait. Um, and it, it's uh, it's difficult to uh, get to the point of, well, how can you have a electronic monitoring or, or an observer program when there's so many fishermen? Um, so the whole purpose of this paper is to try to narrow that down and figure out if you're going to do something like uh, put a, observers out on a boat or electronic monitoring in the boat, which fishermen would be the ones that would be most likely to actually have those interactions. Now, I think it's really important to, to go back to this slide that I showed earlier. That ESA listing for false killer whales was uh, in, in 20, uh, 2012, uh, and, and really the population has been declining ever since. So the current population estimate of the most recent one is from 2021. It's just 138 individuals with five or six or seven individuals expecting to be um, dropping out of the population every year. So this is something that's a really uh, timely, you know, something needs to be done in order to both better understand the cause of the decline and, and potentially come up with solutions to, to reverse it or slow it down. Now, everything I've talked about really has been focused on the main Hawaiian Island insular population, but there's another population, the pelagic population that gets a lot of attention in Hawaii uh, for fisheries interactions. And, and that's because the Hawaii longline fishery, which does have an observer program, uh, in that fishery, false killer whales are the most frequently recorded bycaught species. And based on where that fishery occurs, these are probably um, primarily 
uh, coming from this Hawaii pelagic star. The, the bycatch, bycatch rates have exceeded the potential biological removal level for that population really since the estimates were first available in, in 2000. Uh, and uh, in between 1997 and 2007, it was estimated 124 false killer whales were killed or seriously injured inside the Hawaiian exclusive economic zone by that U.S. longline fishery. We know that bycatch rates are really underestimated. There's some individuals that are not identified to species, and there's also lost gear. And once the animals travel outside of the U.S. waters, they're also subject to bycatch from, from a number of foreign nations that, that uh, is not being accounted for in any way. So the information that was coming from the observer program uh, led to a lawsuit, this time from Earth Justice. They sued National Marine Fishery Service and said, you know, the take's unsustainable, it's about PBR, and you need to form a take, take reduction team. So a take reduction team was formed in 2010. Um, it was a group that is, includes fishermen and scientists and conservationists and National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, the team met uh, five times in 2010, put together a take reduction plan, uh, but that plan, again, this goes back to the inertia side of things, that plan took several years before it went into effect. The main components of the plan are uh, a closure of an area around the main Hawaiian Islands uh, to longline fishing that was open four months of the year, and that was definitely a, a benefit for the insular population. And then the other components of the plan, uh, really there's two main parts. One is a gear fix. So uh, it involves weak circle hooks. This is a circle hook and strong branch lines combined with special handling of the gear. The idea is if you have a weaker hook and a strong branch line, if an animal like this one here uh, gets caught on a line and struggles against the line, there's a potential for it to straighten out that hook and get off the hook. Um, but that really requires the fishermen themselves to handle the gear in a way that puts tension on that line. If they cut the line, obviously that doesn't work. Um, and uh, and you just leave an animal with a lot of trailing gear, which is going to end up uh, having a high probability of, of mortality. So the first five weeks, at the end of the, the take production team, and when the plan went into effect, uh, we were all reasonably hopeful that maybe this would work. Uh, but the first five years after the plan went into effect uh, showed that it wasn't working at all. The interaction rates were unchanged. There was no significant decrease in the serious injury and mortality rate. And in fact, 2021 was the highest levels of bycatch on record. Uh, what we found is that the hooks aren't weak enough, the branch lines aren't strong enough, and the crew are not doing what they're supposed to be doing in the majority of cases. A lot of time they're just cutting the lines, even when there was an observer on board. And this really made it clear that the plan was fatally flawed right from the beginning because because it relied on the handling of the gear and there were only observers on 20% of the trips, when there was no observer on board, then the fishermen were most likely to just cut the lines. They were already doing that even when there was an observer on board. So the plan, uh, I think, was was failed right from the beginning. So the um, if you look at it on a broader scale, uh, that again, I mentioned the take reduction plan went into effect in 2013. Uh, since that time, uh, bycatch and, and mortality and serious injury inside the exclusive economic zone has gone down, but mortality outside the exclusive econ economic zone has gone up. And, and that's reflecting in part that the fishermen are shifting more of their fishing effort offshore outside of U.S. waters. So instead of solving the problem, it's just moving the problem further offshore. And and that uh, is... is um, uh, it's a real problem because the way the National Marine Fisheries Service had been managing the false killer whale populations was only really inside the exclusive economic zone. So uh, earlier this year, we had a new um, meeting of the take production team in person in Honolulu. National Marine Fisheries Service presented their, their new plan on how to manage the, the population. And instead of managing it just inside the exclusive economic zone, they're proposing a pelagic stock management area that will effectively, uh, and this is based on density models. This uh, graph on, or map on the left is a density model of, of false killer whale density. Uh, and it's, it's uh, basically showing that they will try to manage um, U.S. bycatch both inside and outside the exclusive economic zone. 
So that team was really valuable, but we didn't really reach consensus on much. One thing the team did agree on was that 100% of the fishery should have electronic monitoring. And, and that would allow us to really understand what happens, uh, whether there's an observer on board or not. But the big question is, when will that happen? And, and I think most of us think it's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, the industry uh, led development of a fighting line device to increase the chances of straightening the hook and minimize leaving gear on the animals. Uh, but the, the circumstances that fighting line could be used are really narrow. It has to be calm seas with the animal without any entanglement in the line, and they have to have the time to, to get it off without the line breaking and so on. There was certainly consensus that uh, additional training was required for the crew, uh, not just the captains and the owners, because the crew themselves are the first responders, but the crew on these boats are, um, their Eng English is not their first language, um, so there's major language barriers uh, there uh, that's going to limit uh, how well, how effective that crew training may, may be. And the other thing that the team really felt was important was that uh, there's a new import rule that National Marine Fishery Service is going to supposedly start uh, enforcing in, in coming years. And um, countries that don't have any of these types of bycatch reduction measures uh, should be subject to uh, restrictions on the import of fish into the U.S. under this new import rule. But uh, as we'll probably learn later this year when, when NIMS announces that uh, uh, sort of the outcome of that import rule, we'll probably find out that, uh, that they're not going to do a very good job on, on um, actually enforcing it the way everyone thinks it should be enforced. So I'll go back to this um, because it really illustrates the interactions between all of these players in, in false cutter whale conservation and false cutter whale management. Uh, some of them, like the community scientists in the middle here, overlap between science and, and the others category. Um, but false killer whales overlap all of these groups. And, and really, uh, it's it's been interesting to see through the take production team and, and, and other interactions how uh, supportive or not supportive are uh, different groups for, for science or management. For example, uh, individual fishermen from the Hawaii Longline Association and the Hawaii Longline Association itself has actually been incredibly supportive of research. They've allowed um, the Science Center in particular to put cameras on their gear and um, other things to try to better understand the, um, the interactions. We're working with a couple longline fishermen to uh, try to put a camera on the longline itself that will go down and, and get video footage of a, a hooked animal. Uh, and that's been really incredibly valuable to try to better understand what the issues are. Uh, on the other hand, groups like Western Pacific Regional Fishing Management Council in the take production team have really been trying to slow down any management acts, um, action. Uh, and instead of trying to solve the problem, uh, they just seem to be trying to put it off uh, any action as long as possible. Um, I mentioned the examples of NRDC and Earth Justice and Center for Biological Diversity have also been really critical at taking the science that people are doing and making sure that the managers are actually using that science. And often they're forcing those management agencies to use the science through lawsuits. And it's been, it's been very clear that without the uh, enforcement protection of the Marine Mammal Protection Act and, and the Endangered Species Act, uh, that really uh, nothing would have would have happened uh, because of their ability to to force the government to 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 do their job. Um, so it's not really a um, it's not really a, a story that has an ending at this point. Um, where where there's still lots of science that needs to be done, but the example of the main Hawaiian island insular population and the decline really emphasizes that some action needs to be done and uh, and it really needs to be done simultaneous to trying to better understand what the problems are. Um, so I think that's the end for my presentation and uh, I would be happy to answer uh, questions. And um, I see a couple uh, that are in there now and I can I can tackle those and then if if folks have other things that they want to uh, put into the question and, and answer box I'd be happy to answer them uh, so there's a question about epigenetics and aging and um, and 
uh, that study, we, 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 well, what we've learned and we've used our own age estimates of the animals based on the photo identification catalog to inform the genetic epigenetic aging study. Um, and those results are still um, unpublished. They're, uh, it's been done on a subsample of individuals in the population, uh, 97 samples of uh, 75 or 80 individuals. Uh, so we don't really have any, um, you know, amazing results to report other than the fact that the method seems to be fairly effective. And what it may allow us to do in the long run is better characterize the age structure of the population, in particular differences in age structure between um, different social clusters. And uh, if people think about another analogy to killer whales, southern resident killer whales, which are endangered, of course, in the Pacific Northwest, um, of the three pods of southern resident killer whales, L pod has undergone this uh, incredible decline, and J and K pods have been uh, more stable or, or slowly increasing at times. And if we have a way of aging animals within the population, we may be able to determine whether or not one or more of the social clusters is more likely to be doing poorly. Um, another question. Uh, was how does the Navy assist in finding whales? And, and that uh, has mainly come from work off of Kauai. Um, the Navy has a hydrophone range of, off of the west side of Kauai, which is used for uh, training and testing activities. Um, and they've been funding us uh, for about 10 years, usually one project a year, anywhere from eight days to, to two or three weeks, where we go out and we work with Navy scientists, they're monitoring the hydrophone range. Uh, and um, and basically, if they hear false killer whales or pilot whales or beaked whales or other species vocalizing, they can uh, usually localize where the animals are, uh, which direction they're going if they're moving fast, and they can vector us uh, into that group. Uh, and they've been uh, very successful the last couple of years with um, beaked whales and with pilot whales. Uh, and they have put us on false killer whale groups off of Kauai a, a couple times as well. We don't see false killer whales off Kauai very often. Uh, so the the uh, working with the Navy there has been more valuable uh, for other species, but it has worked with um, uh, with false killer whales as well. Uh, so another question, this was uh, the um, about the 1989 aerial survey, which uh, documented a uh, group of 470 individuals. And, and that uh, in that survey, which I mentioned, Steve Leatherwood and Randy Reeves, they were actually taking photos, aerial photos as well. Uh, and they went through and counted the individuals from those aerial photos. Um, and they found these large groups several different days. Uh, and the question is, does that represent an anomaly? And what's the largest group of false killer whales? I'm not sure if this is in reference to the group off Southern California yesterday. Uh, I think that the 470 um, may have been the largest sighting, but there was a mass stranding in Argentina of over 800 individuals. So that 800 uh, individuals in the mass stranding, uh, and I can't remember the, the year, but it was, I think, in the 1920s. Uh, was probably the largest documented group. In in terms of Hawaii, that 470, my uh, feeling is that that was probably the entire insular population at that point, all in one area at one time, or the vast majority of them. And again, going back to the killer whale analogy, you think of super pods of southern resident killer whales, uh, which don't happen very often anymore, but you would often see all of JK and L pod together in Harrow Strait at one time. Uh, and when I was working with those whales uh, in the, the late 80s and 90s, that was, you know, 99 or 100 individuals. And so uh, I think it's, um, it's unusual, um, but it's not unheard of. And I will also mention there's a, an old record, I think it was from 1959 off Southern California, uh, published in a 1961 paper by Ken Norris that um, documented a group of about 300 false killer whales off of Southern California. Um, uh, next question is from uh, Andrew Agagard. Are there any public or published photo identification catalogs of the main Hawaiian Island uh, clusters? Uh, we have actually produced uh, a number of those in the past. Uh, I'm not sure, and the way we've done them um, have been 
uh, you know, the most recognizable individuals from each of what we're now recognizing as four different social clusters. Uh, and we've uh, made them available on our web page for downloading single pages, uh, which could then be um, downloaded and printed. And uh, go to the link here for dolphin and whale species and go to our false killer whale page. And I think uh, some older versions of that main Hawaiian Island animal uh, ID pages are on that web page. Uh, and uh, if they're not, we, we can get them up there uh, and we can try to update them. And, and the whole idea uh, is that, you know, tour operators could, could take them out with them. And then when they see false killer whales would be able to say, hey, this is an individual from cluster one. And it was first documented in, you know, 25 years ago and be able to share that information with their, with their passengers. Um, next question was, are California populations facing similar threats to those in Hawaii? Uh, and is anyone doing research on the population in uh, California? Um, a couple things. Uh, actually, uh, Annie Douglas from Cascadia uh, with a, a bunch of other folks have a, a paper in press right now that um, looks at a whole bunch of independent catalogs uh, along the west coast of, of, uh, of Central America from Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala, uh, Mexico and includes some photos from Southern California and has compared those um, photographs to look at movements among areas. Uh, at least one or two groups from Southern California have been also documented down off the tip of Baja, but there's been no documented movements of those animals with mainland Mexico or further south. Uh, and um, uh, if folks, it is a Great example for the encounter yesterday. If 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 uh, the supposedly was a very large group off Southern California yesterday, which I think was the basis of the the group size uh, question. Um, if people can get photographs from a digital SLR camera uh, rather than a cell phone or a drone, those are most valuable for research because you get the the resolution and the speed to capture fast moving animals, and and their individuals are identified by the dorsal fin. So if any of those photos exist from the encounter uh, yesterday, uh, it'd be extremely valuable to get them to to researchers. Um, Annie at Cascadia would would love to see them uh, to compare them to the the Cascadia, um, Panama, Nicaragua. Uh, Costa Rica catalog and and um, and uh, there are other independent catalogs uh, elsewhere through Mexico. In terms of the threats that the animals in California might be facing, um, well, I think it's important to first say that there doesn't seem to be there's no recognized population of California. What's happening is animals further from the south are coming up into U.S. waters. Um, if this group from yesterday is as large as it was reported to be. Uh, I suspect that that group would have been a um, open ocean group or tropical Pacific open ocean group that moved in. Um, and I say that because the comparison of all these small regional catalogs that have been done all tend to show that group sizes are small, pop, fairly high reciting rates, so populations appear to be small. And when you get uh, a group of hundreds of individuals um, either it's an entire population or it's from an open ocean population that's just much larger. Not sure if there's any other questions. I don't see any in the uh, question and answer box, but. Um, this is, I just wish everybody on the planet would care about the species on the planet because that's just, I mean, I don't, I don't know how this is going to get better. Um, and are there publications? I know there's like a million different organizations and, and this is a hot topic about um, how far away you could be from whales, especially in the Pacific Northwest and, and with our, our residents, Southern residents. Is there anything being done where maybe you're educating, um, focus on educating all of the crew on fishing boats about what to do instead, making some sort of publication that 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 um, can be translated into native languages of, of the crew to have them, you know, buy in a little bit? Yeah, well, I will say that, um, so uh, going, ignoring the longline fishery, but 
but you reminded me of uh, all the nearshore fisheries. One of the things that we made up uh, a number of years ago, and it, it's available on our, our Hawaii species page, um, was an, I, uh, an ID, ID guide to tell the difference between different species of, of blackfish, false killer whales, pilot whales, melon headed whales, and pygmy killer whales. And that actually came from a fisherman that contacted us and said, you know, there's way more false killer whales out there than, than, than you guys think. And, and we went back and forth many times, and he actually helped me put together this ID guide and reviewed it many times. Uh, and then later said to me, well, I think that some fishermen aren't able to tell the difference. Um, and, and so we made that available. We printed out several thousand of them, laminated and gave them out to fishermen and had various partners give them out to fishermen uh, throughout Hawaii. And then the state of Hawaii has printed up probably several thousand more and it has given them out. And that's all being to work with local fishermen to, to try to um, at least make sure that we're talking about apples and apples rather than apples and oranges. If a fisherman says they saw a group of 300 animals, um, 300 false killer whales, well, we want them to know whether or not they really saw 300 false killer whales or did they see 300 melon headed whales. Uh, so, you know, pilot whales are a great example in Hawaii. They look superficially similar to false killer whales. Um, and the population is probably 10 times higher than false killer whales. So a fisherman's going to have a much higher probability just by chance alone of running into pilot whales than false killer whales. And if they're thinking that every false, every pilot whale they see is a false killer whale, then they're not going to believe the scientists and they're not going to recognize that maybe, um, maybe the science is saying something different than what they think. Um, we also, again, for nearshore fishermen, um, we we have a, we got a grant a few years ago, um, and if you Google cameras for fishermen, Cascadia Research, we have a, a web page for it. We we got a grant to buy some cameras and provide them on loan to fishermen to try to engage them in the science to get them taking photos and and contribute them to the science. And and we've we've given a, a number of cameras um, that hasn't been as successful in terms of the, getting information back. Um, but, we, you know, we, we found that, uh, that tour operators are much, much, much better at, at contributing photos than, than fishermen, but, you know, that's also understandable. They, they've got different things that they're, they're doing and, uh, and, you know, often they're trying to avoid the animals, not, not get close to them. Um, in terms of the offshore fishermen and, and the crew and, and, and working with the crew, actually Hawaii, Hawaii uh, Longline Association has put a lot of resources into translating the, um, the materials for um, how to handle a hooked animal into the languages of the, the, the primary languages of the crew. Uh, and the crew are, uh, uh, there's, uh, they they said recently that there's like 20 different languages spoken among the crew, um, but the the primary languages are are um, uh, uh, from the Philippines, um, from Vietnam, and uh, and I, I can't remember what the third primary one is. But they've they've Hawaii Longline Association to try to address this problem have put resources into translating the materials for for crew. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there's one more question about number that you see on the surface being the total count. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it's, uh, I think it really is a difficult one to answer because it depends a lot on the behavior. And I, I have seen a couple of the videos from the false killer whales yesterday. I'm not sure if this was in relation to the, the false killer whales yesterday. Um, you know, sometimes when they're slow moving, uh, and socializing, you could have a large proportion of the animals visible, not necessarily at once, but in a few seconds. Other times it may be, you know, 20%. If you if you multiply it by five times, what you can see at one instance, that might be um, more accurate. Uh, I am curious uh, in, in um, you know, in some areas, false killer whales associate a lot with bottlenose dolphins. Um, and in Hawaii, we see them associated fairly regularly with rough tooth dolphins. Um, so I think you have to be careful um, that if you're just seeing animals in the distance, that there's always a possibility you could have some mixed species groups, and that could influence the, the group size estimate. Um, so it's, it's challenging. Okay. I, and I know there was the wolfin 
years ago. Um, that was the melon headed and a rough tooth dolphin hybrid. Are there any hybrids from false killer whales? Yeah, actually, the, the, the one you're referring to actually, I think, is a uh, false killer whale bottlenose dolphin hybrid at Sea Life Park in Hawaii. Um, and false killer whales, well, bottlenose dolphins will hybridize with anything, you know, uh, whether or not it's a cetacean or, or not. <laughs> Right. Um, it's a and, whole other you know, talk. <laughs> yeah. But, but false killer whales, I, I think that um, uh, we've seen photos once that um, that suggest a possible false killer whale pilot whale hybrid. Um, uh, false killer whale bottlenose dolphin hybrids, I suspect, are not. Um, it's occurred in captivity, but I suspect it might uh, occur in the wild as well. Um, uh, there's a researcher in New Zealand uh, who's been studying false killer whales there for a long time, and and there they find long-term stable associations between bottlenose dolphins and false killer whales, um, and it it wouldn't be surprising if if hybridization uh, occasionally occurs. I mean, in the in the cetacean world, hybridization occurs fairly regularly. We documented a, a, a melon-headed whale rough-toothed dolphin hybrid off of off of Kauai a few years back and and of course blue whales and humpbacks and uh, blue whales and fin whales and and um, bob, uh, harbor porpoise and dolls porpoise you know there's just a lot of hybridization that occurs in in the wild as well okay um looking no further questions okay well thank you for your mind and your heart and your time and uh this is a fascinating and and um tragic and yeah and national resource defense council gets most of my money when i die so uh they're fighting the good fight earth justice too so um you know we've got to have somebody care i wish it was just every individual um but legally um i like people being held accountable so thank you for that and them existing and uh no further questions okay thank you so much who won your game did you check uh, it ended up being tied now, getting to the World Cup, Women's World Cup, there was a game that ended just as uh, the presentation started. So, okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you again so much, Robin. Um, we all learned a lot. So, um, that's thank always you. My pleasure. Okay. Have a good right. rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye.